Um, so my experience playing MMORPGs, which are online role-playing games, goes back to basically 2015. Um, I just attended my PhD, you know, it was like that March, basically as I already graduated at that point, just like two months of uh, a lame duck session, I guess you might say, of just not doing anything, besides writing research. But um, I also turned on my PS3 for the first time in years, like actually trying to play and uh, just enjoy. And I played this thing called Grand Theft Auto V Online. And so when I started playing GTA V Online, I realized a couple of things. Um, I made a female avatar. Uh, and I named her Trish for whatever reason, but it's my very first time ever playing an online game. And I realized I would get sometimes these invites from male avatars in the GTA 5 Los Santos world, like to go on their yachts, their helicopters with them, you know, go like in the pool with them and stuff like that. Um, and I was just like starting out. I didn't have really the body armor like kind of buff yet you can get at certain levels or I didn't have access to almost anything, but I just made a attractive Hispanic you know, presenting woman, basically. I never use voiceover in uh, my sex, you know, so uh, if I use my voice in the headset, people probably tell me, like, oh, that's a male, like, get off my helicopter, like, push me out the helicopter, game over, right? Um, so I never use my actual voice while I'm playing, um, but I just kind of realized how much easier the game seemed to be when I was getting all these, you know, favors, basically, this stream it from, from male gamers, uh, who I assume are male gamers. That's also a key thing with this, right? So, the idea of woman like me is me kind of extending my experiences playing online games into more of an ethnographic domain of just looking at, you know, my research here, you know, UCSD, just like back when I was living in Texas, is focused on evolutionary psychology, uh, gender socialization, um, you know, the ways in which uh, how we're raised, how we raise boys and girls, you know, to expect that boys make the first move, you know, heteronormative scripts, you know, to ask someone out. Uh, that you know, females be the one to receive the wedding ring when someone goes down and needs to ask you know, her to marry him, uh, that those scripts that we're all kind of raised with about who does what, um, they don't stop at the digital water's edge. They continue on into the game world. And so if I seem to be a woman and I'm dressing like a woman, I have a female's name in my mannerisms, behavior, I have a, a pink car, right? So my like, first car GTA, I like went to a spray shop, like made my car pink. So if like everything that you do when you present yourself reflects someone who might be a female in real life, then the male gamers in that world, um, who are mostly playing like uh, male avatars, they might treat you as such. And so it makes just everything you do somewhat easier, more enjoyable. Um, and one of the ways I kind of contrast that versus real life is, you know, if you were to make a black avatar in the game, um, it might be like playing on hard mode, right? If you make a light-skinned female avatar in the game, it's like playing on easy mode. Um, so the avatar you see on screen right here, um, Gamer Girl, as I always refer to her as, uh, she's the darkest character I've ever made, in fact. Um, she has, well, I shouldn't like to say she has, she presents as someone who has a West Asian, Middle Eastern, Persian, Iranian, you know, background. Um, and I've been like, I've mentioned a few times, you know, with my guild in Final Fantasy XIV, you know, that, oh, it's going to be Ramadan soon, or like, you know, um, are you guys fasting? Things like that, just like trying and have my performativity continue in terms of real life stuff I might be doing. Uh, so it kind of carries over into like, oh, you look like this, uh, you dress like this, and you're also putting things into like the guild chat like this. I guess you are that person in real life. So the way I identify myself in real life, I'll uh, go ahead and kind of give you a breakdown of that. I identify as someone who is um, cisgender, a heterosexual male, um, whose pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, so X, Y chromosome male would be one of the ways I identify myself. In the video game world, I identify as a bisexual X triangle button, circle button, square button woman. Um, so that's the virtual identification. My virtual pronouns would be she, her, and hers. But like pronouns, he, him, and his. Um, now, there, there are a few cases more recently where I've even like used Gamer Girl um, across domains into like reality. What I mean by that is this. To make sure that people in my guild could not figure out who I am in real life, I had to make sure that the account that I used with Final Fantasy XIV was an account that had an email with a female name. And so I have like a fake email address. Uh, well, I mean, it's not fake, but this email address I made like for Gamer Girl, which I've also used myself uh, a few times, just kind of checking you know, some other kind of uh, research and inquiry. But, um, I made her her own email account. And so I noticed in a few exchanges via email that when I would send an email, you know, to 
some place as myself, you know, as, you know, a um, mostly black male, right? So I have Native American uh, heritage. I consider myself a third generation, multi racial person with Native American background, but you look at me, you're going to see black male, right? Um, so I send emails out, you know, of myself, just as me, my Jared.Willis, you know, Gmail accounts. I've also sent out emails as Gamer Girl. And the difference, basically, do that real fast while I'm working on that. The difference is that I tend to get like fuller, more detailed responses from people whenever I've sent emails as Gamer Girl, relative to emails I've sent as uh, myself uh, to the exact same like entities, exact same you know uh, personnel. Uh, and it's interesting because one of the things I also notice is like not just like a reply more often, it'd be like a more detailed reply, and even the things that you might say at the very end of an email chain, you know, like um, uh, hope you have a, a good weekend. Um, you know, take care. Um, that sounds great. Thanks so much. I would get a reply back on that of like, oh yeah, sure thing. You know, like, like the responses I would get back just in terms of uh, those small end of, you know, conversation pieces, you know, like, yeah, like here's your things like, oh, it looks great. Uh, um, I would never get that kind of like, you know, like, oh, that, that's so sweet and stuff. Like my email, uh, the same maybe female individual um, as myself, a, as a black woman. Uh, and so, that's just one way in which Gamer Girl, in my usage of her, has even transcended just the game world alone. Um, oh, also, as a side question, real fast, is there any way in which um, anyone who wants to join the talk can be like admitted automatically? I have like a minute two people, like manually myself, getting like a little button when it pops up. But uh, he's oh, like, don't worry, I'm coming. admitting people as they come in. Okay. Yeah. See Johansson in the chat. I put the chat box over here on my other monitor. But so this is just like an example of how uh, use Gamer Girl across domains. And her name for the email account is not gamergirl at gmail.com. It's like a first name and a last name that I just made up for her. Um, also, I've used the same first and last name for every female I've made since the first one. The first one I mentioned, I named her Trish. Uh, I gave you her name because I'm not concerned about anyone sharing it and it like ruining my research. I'm not going to tell you Gamer Girl's name because that's still kind of an ongoing investigation. But um, I use the same name for every single female avatar, um, whether it's Elder Scrolls and Xbox or you know, Final Fantasy on uh, PS4, which I think Xbox goes to PS5. All right, so kind of just that real fast. A few of the uh, other examples, maybe before we jump into stuff with the video game is that the narratives I'm going to be discussing in terms of how courtship scripts, socialization and stuff works you know, in the video game world, it also works outside of that. I mean, I kind of mentioned the email example a moment ago, but if you just look at you know, dating apps, right? So look at MDAs, mobile dating applications, Tinder, OkCupid, Match.com, eHarmony. Uh, the same rules tend to apply, right? So it's not just that uh, we're being reinforced in heteronormative ways when we're playing these games that either have storylines that are kind of tailored towards hero normativity, um, or we have gamers in the online world that are reinforcing hero normative ideas in their own play style themselves. Um, even sometimes among those who might gender swap, right? So a key term for um, overall research with this is called gender swap. If you look at any literature on Google Scholar, Psych Info, uh, you put like in gender swapping, you'll find a lot of articles that basically go into the discussion. I shouldn't say a lot, but a growing list of articles in the last decade uh, that go into this uh, overall discussion and what it usually might mean about the game or about how they want to play the game, so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, MDAs as another kind of context outside of gaming where we see these same patterns take place, where um, people might have thought back in the 80s and 90s that the internet was going to democratize everything, make things more egalitarian. It was going to remove the scripts that we were kind of forced to live under, uh, you know, basically up until World War II when things start changing. Uh, but the internet has been anything but that. The internet has in a lot of ways reinforced the things that we have come to see or predict or expect uh, in our gender interactions in the world. And so if you look at research by Tinder, for instance, you know, they find that uh, males are far more likely to be the ones to initiate. Males are the ones who will swipe just endlessly across their profiles, almost like they're not even looking, like it's a no look swipe. Swipe, 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 swipe. Let your finger rest. Swipe, 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 swipe some more and just not even looking at it. And so females usually have maybe a long list of males who swiped in their profile to maybe choose from, to be you know, selective in terms of they want to respond to. Um, I guess on Tinder, it's called like matching or however it works on, on that app. Um, but 
Uh, males are the ones who are more likely to be the ones to send messages, to reach out to someone, to make the first move, you know, so on and so forth. And so outside of the app uh, Bumble, you know, where Bumble kind of makes the female make the first move, um, which I wonder how that would work in the case of like lesbian. But uh, in essence, uh, outside of Bumble, it's usually going to be the males making the first move. That's just involving kind of raised with, socialized with, you know, come to expect. Um, so anything you look at from digital interaction across sex, you're probably going to find some degree of similarity in the behavior of people, you know, engaging in interaction, uh, similarity to heteronormative expectations, scripts, you know, systemic uh, norms that tell us this is how you should be a pure male or female. Uh, and I, as I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, increasingly understand, gender is non-binary. Uh, gender is, you know, might be masculine, feminine, androgynous, non-binary, gender queer. Um, I mean, it's a spectrum. There, there's no reason to try and box anyone into certain uh, ideas of who they are and how they want to express themselves and live their truth. Um, even if we might have differences when it comes to um, sex, you know, as a separate terminology, separate system, Gender is not um, the exact same thing as sex. Gender is a more kind of freedom of expression, live your life a certain way. Um, even so, and a lot of stuff in the internet and digital media, we're still kind of pushing that direction and we kind of push each other in that direction as well. So going back to Gamer Girl, some examples with this. Whenever I create my avatars uh, in any game I'm playing online, Elder Scrolls, GTA V, ever since my first avatar, I've been more intentional about it. Um, Black Desert Online, um, which I'll get to like the PvP, PvE thing in a few minutes as well, the Black Desert Online, uh, Fallout 76. So if you play Fallout 4, Fallout 3, you probably know about Fallout Vegas. You probably heard about Fallout 76 as well, which, um, which wasn't the best thing ever, but it was a pretty fun game. It's just not, I mean, like the best online game ever played. Um, whatever game you play, it's the same thing you're going to uh, be able to expect, that if you have a female avatar, you have a much easier time getting males to basically help you do certain things. Right? That's the basic context for women like me. Uh, that if we are, you know, let's say a little girl growing up, uh, sees her brother playing with a doll in her. Her dad takes the doll from her brother's hands and says, boys, don't do that. Boys, don't play with dolls, right? Says, go out there and play catch with your friends, play football with your friends. That little girl, even if she might, you know, become one of the most egalitarian-minded, um, you know, lean-in, Sheryl Sandberg board you know, of besties, you know, person in her future, um, she was still that little girl who was socialized by seeing her brother, um, you know, punish, basically playing with a doll. And so she might want a husband in the future who's going to maybe be a more masculine individual, uh, reflecting how she saw her dad raising her brother, right? We all swim in the same water, right? Males and females, we're all in the same water. And so you're more often going to see maybe uh, males accept the wider variety of what they'll see as desirable among women. Uh, then you might see women accepting a variety of things you might desire among men. Right? So a male might as equally date a woman who's a tomboy as a woman uh, who is, you know, the stereotypical, like maybe girly or feminine uh, individual. Females are less likely to date a tom girl or opposite of a tomboy. Like a tom girl or a metrosexual male. Um, than say a male with a, a tom, right? Like that's the key difference. Uh, there's a wider kind of range of for it to females and it, it tends to play out uh, in this aspect as well. It also means there are more pressures on those of us who play as women to behave and do certain things. So for example, at the guild house, um, any game you play, you have like certain things you might do like, you know, watering people's crops or trying to grow for potions to make in the future, that kind of stuff. Usually there's more pressure on females in the guild to do those things. Usually there's more pressure on females in the guild to be the ones when you log on to ask people like how they're doing, how their week's going, um, are you doing okay? I'm sorry you lost your best friend CLBID, which was a real guild conversation we had back in June last year. In fact, two of my guild mates lost someone to CLBID last summer. Um, so we had like these just kind of long discussions about that, that loss of real life while we're in this you know, virtual life you know, environment in Final Fantasy 14. Uh, and usually there's like more of a sense that the females of the guild be the ones to actually lead the conversation. The females of the guild be the ones to help, you know, console those who are expressing some real things in their life. Um, now, <laughs> the, the kind of like bias aspect of this is that if we do it, if we as, as women avatars do this, um, there's not really the same kind of praise you might get as if you're a male who does it. 
All right. So if the male is the one who asks everyone's doing and like kind of gives the consolation, it's like the best thing in the world. But if we do it as women, it's like there's no, it's like no one cares because it's just expected. Um, so that's that's kind of annoying sometimes. Like if, if a male avatar gardens the crops and it's just like, oh my God, like, you know, increase his rank in the guilt in the tier, right? If I garden, if I like water the crops in the garden, it's just like, oh, thanks you know, for doing your role. Um, so it's just a like different way in which it's perceived. And I feel like it's similar to like the real world where if someone like brings Christmas cards, you know, for uh, end of year meeting or holiday cards, let's say, puts them in people's mailboxes or Jolly Ranchers attached to them or candy canes. Uh, if it's a female employee who does that, she might not be praised the same way versus like if it was Magic Mike who did that. Because Mike did that, like, oh my God, like he's such a like, you know, tough guy and manly man. He like brought everyone cards. That's so awesome. Like you go, Mike. But if it's Monica who does it, you guys expect that because Monica's female, right? So the different ways in which you're praised for things are not based on if people see it as your expected role, right? Uh, that bias definitely comes out in the game world as well. So let me go a little bit into um, ways in which I present myself um, while I'm playing the game. This is referred to as performativity. So some things that are important, you know, to try and uh, make sure that you uh, have in terms of how your avatar is designed, the way in which you behave, things like that. One of the key things is uh, breast lips. If you make an avatar that has like on the breast slider when you're like making your character in the very start, if the avatar has just like the maximum breast size possible for that game, no one's gonna think you're a female. It's just gonna be like immediately like, oh, 13 year old boy or you know, immature adult male. Um, you can't just like max out breast size and expect that to be accepted by others as though you're like really a woman. Um, so an example of this is like a poll I did on this question recently even. Uh, it's like, which one of these two avatars is being played by a male? Uh, and yeah, everyone pretty much said like the one on the right because it was like a much larger breast size and you would probably expect a female avatar to have uh, when you're playing a game. Now, to be honest, both of these avatars are played by males, but people uh, more easily discern that the one on the right was played by a male. There is another poll like right next to it, uh, somewhat cut off, but basically it's a question of like, um, who's least likely to lose their virginity as someone of the same sex? Uh, and the poll basically not like, bisexual males whole different context anyway. But, so breast size is like one of those things that weren't more um, The other one in that same um, number one for that was looking at how much someone um, jumps around or height uh, proportion. You might you might have like your avatar based on sex or gender. So if most females in the world are going to be shorter than most males in the world, right? Um, if the average height for females is five four, five five, average height for males is you know five nine, five ten. Uh, then you want to make sure as a female avatar, you're not going to be taller than more than half the males in your guilds. They're going to know automatically, like, you, you probably are not a female in real life. Uh, so I'll always you know, like, make my avatar somewhat shorter than I expect, you know, the males in my guild to be. Um, now, one of the really unique things, I forget, like, to say that did this. Um, I would cite them if I could, but um, once they actually looked at the issue of how much someone jumps in terms of successful performativity. So given that males are generally speaking taller than females, right? Um, what was it? So the WNBA, I think Women's Basketball Association, the average height is like around five, 10 to like six feet maybe. Um, like only like 1% of all females in the world are like six feet or taller. Uh, the average height for NBA is six foot seven. So basically the average height for WNBA is like males average height. Just about. Um, so just given the difference in height in terms of XX chromosome, XY chromosome, um, if you're a male playing as a female, especially in a first person, you know, camera game, like where you're playing, let's say Far Cry. So in Far Cry, it's like always first person. Uh, Summer Punch 2077, also first person, unless you're driving. But uh, basically males who play as females might give themselves away if they jump a lot. Because the jumping indicates that you're not used to being that short. You're not used to being at like that point of perception. And so to like try maybe see over something or like, you know, uh, have a sense that you're taller than you currently are, um, some male gamers might jump excessively and the jumping uh, gives away their sex in real life. Um, because if you're a female, you might be more used to being a shorter height and thus you wouldn't have to jump as much if like you can see over things or you know, stuff like that. So even hitting the jump button 
a lot is a way in which you might reveal your sex, um, your real life sex while playing opposite gender in the game world. Um, names, maturity of someone's name, very important. So if you look, look at just the um, examples here I've played out, uh, this is from a post I have on Medium, uh, which I believe is like my woman like me posts, uh, in fact, but uh, the name is for the male. So Tiger Tron, Horn Muffin, Daddy Wombolt, and of course, you'll be remiss not to mention Pookie Pants. Um, it's just because guys, but you know, the females have usually much more mature names, right? So you have Anastasia Laria, Kyoko Sakuya, um, female name. I mean, generally speaking, the female names tend to be that variety, first and last name. Right, breast size is a big uh, giveaway for sure, absolutely. Uh, you like a male, Laura, Tarin, right there. So the females have usually first and last names and the names also make sense. The males might not always have first and last names. They might have like a double first name, basically. Um, things that are trying to indicate some sense of dominance or awesomeness they perceive in themselves. Tigertron probably thinks he's really awesome, right? Um, so, <laughs> Pookie Pants thinks he's just the coolest thing in the world as well. But I mean, that's a, a key sex difference that you will see. So you can obviously tell that Corn Muffin and Tigertron are, are male gamers. Um, other key giveaway for Tigertron, by the way, and Daddy Wombolt is they both have on their helmets. So a lot of games will give you the option to toggle your helmet off. You know, like the little button, like in your menu, you toggle helmets, you know, visible on or off. So you're still wearing it in terms of armor stats for your character. Um, so you won't like, you know, have less armor for a boss fight, but it's not visible to anyone else or even to yourself. Um, male avatars are less likely to hide their helmets. They'll have it covering their face. That's relatively important given that female avatars, research has shown, uh, they tend to spend more time in the menu screen making, uh, you know, put on the, on the makeup, the foundation, the lipstick, everything about the avatar's appearance and beauty. They put a lot more time investment into that than males do. And so if you're going to invest all that time making sure that you have like the most beautiful woman you can possibly make as your avatar, why would you wear a helmet? You know, whereas with guys, it's kind of like they log into the game, they look in the mirror, give themselves a thumbs up, and they're out the door. It's like nothing. Um, you know, for females, there's going to be more effort put into it. Always jumping. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. I mean, I think the, the jumping one is definitely a unique insight into it, given the height difference. Uh, that's also one uh, member of my lab actually made a great point about this um, back in February, where she said that Zoom has democratized height in a sense, right? So the person who might otherwise be seen as the tallest person in a, in a board meeting, you know, in the workplace or something, you can like, you know, just demand things of his peers or like talk over someone else and just command the room. Well, when you're on Zoom, I don't care if you're six foot five. Right, you're not any taller on Zoom, the camera looking at you than someone who's, you know, five foot one. Right. So Zoom kind of democratizes height. And height is one of those like key pillars of patriarchy uh, that has like helped to reinforce a lot of you know sexist outcomes of females, you know, since, since time basically. But uh, like in Australia, I'll give an example real fast, you know, from my evolutionary uh, material. But in Australia for like four decades they gave um, girls who were seen as like being too tall in middle school, they would give those girls growth stunting hormones to make sure that they would not grow as much anymore so that they would stay short enough to find a husband. So if you were a girl who was like maybe five foot seven in sixth or seventh grade, they put you on growth stunting hormones to make sure that you wouldn't get too much taller or else you might be hard to find a husband one day because of course no one ever thought she might be lesbian or might be bisexual and want to marry a woman. Uh, but it would actually like stunt females growth on purpose uh, because you know, for one, it's like, you know, gotta find a mate. Uh, and two, uh, tall females threaten the idea of patriarchy. Uh, it threatens like that pillar of male dominance that heights you know, might, uh, might give just by being a business. Uh, hair, definitely hair. Oh my God, yeah. So one of the key things in my performativity as a woman is I, I do take more care to my hairstyles, highlights, uh, length of it. Uh, I haven't like had a really good cut or change in a while. I'm probably going to change it sometime soon, if not this month in the Um, But basically, the, the hair is important. And so if you do have like your headgear showing as a female, which sometimes uh, you might, 
usually the headgear is a corsage or like a bonnet, a pin in your hair, a tiara, right? So a tiara you have like on the forehead, but it's like not maybe covering up your hair or like your makeup, like a full helmet otherwise would. So whenever females headgear is showing, usually it's something like that, where the makeup in the hair is still visible. Um, another kind of key point for this is the uh, weapons. So males have to use the weapons showing on their person when they're kind of just walking around casually. Females more often might hide the weapon when they're outside of combat. Uh, so males want to make sure you can like see just how large their sword, you know, is, you know, like their axe or something, whereas females will hide it um, until there's actually like some fight going on. So there's much more kind of pressure on the aesthetic uh, part of it when it comes to women. And just going back to the comment I saw a second ago regarding um, hair. So I also perform uh, as a bisexual woman, um, not always like on purpose or something like that, but I, I like try to make sure my guild has a sense that I have an interest in like a male and female NPC in the game. Uh, like last night, even <laughs> last night before I logged off, I mentioned uh, a certain character in Elder Scrolls um, is Husbando. So I said like, you know, he's Husbando, like, you know, like wife to Husbando kind of uh, description. Uh, so it was like a way of reinforcing the idea of like, oh, she like likes males. Um, but it's also kind of hard to maintain bisexuality as a performance because if you are maybe showing interest in a male for a period of time, they'll think that you're just a straight woman. If you show interest in a female, they'll think that you're a lesbian. So the person that you're dating, if you're bisexual, kind of like leads to more erasure of bisexuality because you know people will forget you had interest in opposite sex before that, right? Um, but I had a poll about how I might change my hair, you know, uh, last year, back in October, and people voted overall for the bisexual bob on the left, as opposed to the one on the right. Um, the bisexual bob is basically kind of um, one of the hairstyles that's seen as maybe more common uh, among bisexuals in that, in that community. Uh, not that everyone who's bisexual has that kind of haircut, or everyone who's lesbian might have a short haircut or a pixie haircut or you know, things you might see from Ginny and the L word, you know, season four kind of thing, but, uh, or season two rather. But basically appearance, so like hairstyle and appearance, the kind of clothes you wear, if you're in a lesbian community, a gay male community, uh, the reason like for that hairstyle stereotype, the short haircut stereotype is because hairstyle and how you look can be seen as a cue for safety, you know, that this is a safe person to interact with. And so if you're maybe a lesbian living in Alabama, Having maybe that kind of haircut will let other women who are uh, bisexual or lesbian know that you're a safe person to interact with. Maybe if you're living in California, you don't have to worry about that. So your hairstyle might vary more if you're a lesbian in California than if you're a lesbian in Alabama. And that's just performativity in terms of like just real life um, code switching, utilitarianism, and how you uh, present yourself to other people. Uh, but I am leaning kind of towards the haircut on the left a little bit. That's one I might change to you know, a little bit more. The only reason I didn't like go for it at first because like in the back of the head of like the one on the left, there's like no like kind of bun or anything, whereas the one on the right does have that. And if you look at someone like from behind, uh, the flatness of like the haircut on the left, someone seeing me from behind, uh, it might not indicate automatically uh, female sex. Um, and I kind of like definitely want any male gamer who sees me to assume female sex. So the one on the right, I kind of feel closer to for that reason because the way it's rolled up. Anyways. Also, I only have like one main on Final Fantasy XIV or one avatar I played with the entire time. I never made a second one. On Elder Scrolls, I have, you know, uh, more than one avatar. Um, now there's one I've played with basically ever since 2017 consistently, but um, I had another one like when I first started playing. And with that avatar, I indicated in the guild, uh, like in all five of my guilds, you can have like five guilds in Elder Scrolls, just one in Final Fantasy, but I indicated in every guild that I was lesbian. That was a mistake <laughs> to say I was lesbian because basically the males of the guild felt like there's no point trying to do anything for me. Like if you're if you're a lesbian, then why am I gonna like like try and get my digital manhood by impressing you by helping you with this dungeon or something, right? Um, but if I say that I'm bisexual, which I've done ever since then, then it increases like my rewards I might receive from male avatars and some females as well. So that's the reason like for the performativity of bisexuality as opposed to being lesbian or even straight female. Now I've highlighted here, um, I do this like suddenly, 
I try to like maybe mention a few times every now and then who I'm into, male or female, get a sense that I'm bisexual. Because if you like, if you pronounce it too much, if you kind of state it too much that you're bisexual, um, it's going to start to seem like maybe you're not. Uh, and there's good research on this. Like if you're an uh, individual or a group organization that's like on the edge of being in a group, you're more likely to point out that group identity that you in fact have to like try to make sure people know about it. So if you're like a small airport, like it kind of says here uh, on the slide, if you're a small airport that's otherwise international, you'll make sure to put international in your title to make sure people know that you're in fact international airport. But if you go to like Reagan or you go to JFK, they don't have to like put Air National Airport at JFK. It's obvious. You go to LAX, they're not going to put like, you know, Air National on all like their brochures at LAX. Like it's obvious it's Air National, right? But if you're like a smaller airport that happens to be Air National, you're going to make sure people know about it, right? Um, and one of the examples they have here as well is how in um, textbooks for psychology, you're more likely to see um, descriptions about how, how uh, psychology is a real science. Psychology is just like physics. Psychology is just like chemistry. Uh, there's like a whole chapter section in chapter one about like why psychology is like um, one of the hard sciences. Um, you're not going to see in a chemistry textbook or a book about physics why it's a real science. They don't have to do that. Right. So basically, if, if you're like more part of a group and it's just assumed that you're part of a group, you're not really going to mention those things about yourself. Um, like the small airport, it's international or like psychology, which is a science. But we have to kind of mention then how we're a science, uh, whereas chemistry does not have to mention how it's a science. It's, uh, it's taken as a given. Um, my uh, best friend um, in, in California, first best friend I had in California, uh, she now goes to Penn. Uh, Penn is an Ivy League school, um, just on the margin, basically, of being Ivy League school. But Penn's is Ivy League. Um, they're more likely to indicate that they're Ivy League than, say, Harvard or Yale would. Right? Harvard's not going to go around saying we're Ivy League. They don't have to. But Penn will do so because they're just basically on the margin of entering that group. So that's why I kind of, I kind of say like I suddenly mention it because if I kind of mention it too much, those sort of seem like, well, is that avatar really female? Are they really bisexual? If you mention it too often, that that's the idea. Um, so I walk around and seem like, yes, I'm bisexual. I'm proud. Like I'm from my avatar here. They're not going to believe I'm actually female anymore. Like it's like okay, if you're female and bi, you have to say it that much. Um, that that's why I kind of like I mentioned it suddenly. Questions to buy Bob? Absolutely. The erasure is dif difficult to escape for sure when you're forming as a bisexual avatar. It's yeah, it, it's hard. I mean, unless you just like put it as your self definition in, in like the guild chat somewhere. It's like where you describe yourself and it's just in your menu screen. Anyone can just go and look at it. Unless you kind of put it there, it's hard to keep people's knowledge of that, you know, uh, up to date. Because they'll just look at like, you know, who you're talking about in chats, you know, male or female, and they'll kind of like decide your orientation from there. Uh, so it, it is like hard to determine bisexuality in that way. Um, I mean, one of the things I did at one point in the game when I changed my hair, I basically just like cut off a whole lot of my hair. And like cutting the hair off in a sense was, um, so like one thing, whenever you like finish a major DLC in a game, um, you might decide to have a makeover for your character, right? So there's like the main story quest and there's like DLCs um, about, you know, Heaven's Ward and Final Fantasy XIV and there's um, Stormblood, there's uh, Shadowbringers, there's gonna be another one, I guess, you know, 6.0 coming sometime later this year. Uh, but basically after the first main quest, I changed my, my style. And it's kind of like, almost like kind of a breakup feel, like when you like cut off your hair a little bit. So the hair that I have now is hair that that person never saw before, like I'm, I'm a new me. Anyway, that's just kind of like the way I approach it. Now, one of the um, ways in which you can definitely help to gain yourself male attention is wearing a skirt. Um, I've described in, in an entire post <laughs> about the power of skirts, uh, that skirts are like the most powerful item in the game, perhaps, when it comes to utilitarian advantages it gives you when trying to court male attention to complete quests, to beat difficult bosses, to uh, make a group with to go into dungeons that if you wear a skirt, I mean, my God, it, it just, the male gaze, the digital male gaze cannot help itself. And so it's just one of those additional anchors of performativity of how the way in which you present yourself can lead to more uh, support from others, um, you know, based on sex in the game world. 
Let me just something about this as well, real fast for females who gender swap. So males gender swap to become females more than vice versa. But it's also the case that males are better at it on average than females are. What I mean is this. Women, like so we have like an XX chromosome, you know, woman gamer in real life who plays as a male avatar in the game. Women tend to behave in a much more aggressively masculine way, <laughs> almost like overperforming masculinity uh, when they uh, play as males in a way that's not true of, of how males behave when they play as women. Um, like there's not a sense that you're overperforming femininity um, if, if you're a guy playing as a girl compared to females playing as men. Like that has been seen in a few studies. Like it's a kind of consistent finding at this point in time. So it is, a, it's kind of curious as to like why that's the case. Um, but I also go back to the idea that there is a wider range that we'll allow for females. And so if there's like a more narrow range we allow for males and behavior, the females might feel they're playing a male avatar. They have to kind of fit that narrow range that's available for males and thus they might overdo it a little bit. Um, whereas if females can be anything from tomboyish or really feminine, and um, there's just more range that males playing as women can work with to still give the perception that they are in fact a female in real life. Um, whenever I've like had a post on Medium a few times, I'll um, have a story like this where basically it's onlyfans.com. You know, if you want to see more, go to onlyfans.com and basically a link just goes to my Medium piece. Uh, but it's a way of like using the you can basically use sexuality of your avatar in that way to monopolize male attention. Um, like when I first like actually started putting any research or piece on this together, it was back in 2019. And it was an email like to a few like real world colleagues in fact, um, where I basically said that I think I have a type for men, um, a type for men in, in a digital world, as well, but um, that I tend to like male avatars who are kind of like jerks everyone else but they're nice to me in a sense so it's like they're they're like not going to share their potions or like you know give like away their loot or extra money to any other gamers they might come around other females but like they'll share it with me they'll help me out with stuff help me be some boss right so i kind of like the guys who are sometimes a-holes um but like if they're a-holes they're willing to accept for me or if i can like change them in some way or like you know it's like a little bit like i feel like that's the guys i tend to prefer because in that case, one, the resources that you feel like are limited, you want him only to like expend with you. Um, if you already see him like not oversharing with everyone else, well, that's a good sign, right? So if he's kind of a jerk, that's a good sign. He'll be nice to me, hopefully, right? So um, those kind of guys, the guy who seems like they're maybe just you know bad news, but if I can make them good for me, then, then hey, watch out. It also kind of gives me a greater sense that I'm protected, right? So if um, Anyone like tries to mess with me like on Black Desert Online, which is like a year or so ago when I was like playing that a lot, but on uh, on BDO, if anyone like tries to mess with me, PvP me in the open world, that kind of stuff, hey, he's right there. He'll go ahead and just like, you know, get you right back, you know, PK you right back. So that's the idea. You get that sense of like protection. The resources he has will not be shared with every single female around. Um, and you can kind of just like court him to be, you know, a good mate or just you. Um, in the way in which you can, like one of the like advantages of doing this, you also might monopolize a guy's time. So imagine that in real life, you have a guy um, who's, you know, like works in you know, a full-time job and stuff, gets home, he has maybe like four or five hours of downtime before he has to get ready for bed for the next day. And so let's say two or three of those hours, let's say three of those, you know, five hours he has, he might play the game a little bit. If I can monopolize his time for two of those three hours, that's a pretty significant investment of time that he has. And so he's going to become more committed to me because uh, people like see time as a territory that's theirs. Or just like if uh, you have like your me time, it's your territory, you have like time for yourself, people see time as territory. If he's investing that territorial space of his time to me, when I log on again next time, he's gonna be like right back next to me, right? So I've got his attention, I've got him in a sense. Uh, if I don't give him everything right away, play hard to get a little bit, if I kind of like don't overshare stuff, you know, too fast, it just kind of keeps the person along. Any additional kind of thoughts or questions for going to go forward? I do want to show really quickly um, another poll I had. So 
I was looking at basically which avatars are more likely to be asked to take off their mask. And I like wore a mask myself uh, for a while in the game. It's like try and reinforce, you know, social distancing, you know, make sure that you wear a mask and stuff like that. So it's my Texas mask. But so I would like wore a mask, my avatar for a little bit in the game to try and reinforce that. I have this thing in the game called a chocobo, which is like a big bird you can ride around and fly around in eventually. Uh, my chocobo, I renamed it from Coach Scale, which is a Persian name of endearment. Uh, again, performing, you know, being a Persian woman. Uh, I renamed it to wear a mask. So I'm like just riding around like on this like big bird that's named wear a mask, <laughs> which I'm sure does not annoy anyone. But um, basically female avatars kind of report that they would be the ones asked more often to take their mask off. Because again, you have to like be able to see someone's face. The idea is to see if she is like maybe attractive or not. Um, that's more of a pressure put on women more so than men. Uh, you might have also noticed, maybe some people saw this, there's also kind of a really gendered way in which avatars sit sometimes, which seems almost unnecessary. <laughs> but even the way in which uh, you sit down is gendered. So, uh, that seems like almost overkill, like why is that gendered? So going back to this real fast, um, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, the reason like my voice being withheld because uh, if I were to actually uh, use headset for my voice, it gives me away, right? And just gives me away immediately. Um, another important variable here I haven't mentioned yet, though, is the variable of skin tone. Um, I've discussed for the most part thus far uh, the issue of like, you know, just sex and courtship and how that plays into things, but skin tone is also important. Uh, so if you want to maximize your success when it comes to getting someone's attention, it's, it's not just about having maybe a really attractive female avatar who has a nice hairstyle, good makeup going, smoky eye look, you can get smoky eyes to work for you with your sliders and stuff like that. It's worth it. Um, but also having maybe a desirable skin tone, right? Because there is a sense that, um, let's see what's the best way to put this. Uh, like one of the studies we go over in social psychology, uh, which kind of is perfect on this, is if you're trying to like an iPod Nano and you have like on Google, um, shop, Google store, a white hand holding iPod Nano, a black hand holding it, or a white hand with a tattoo holding it. Um, both of the white hands, the one with no tattoo or a tattoo, will have more success selling it, more copies of it, more items of it, and at higher bidding prices than the black hand holding the same iPod Nano. Um, that, that's just the exact same device, you know, the same hardware, everything. It's just different color hand holding it. And so that's just like the reality of uh, racial capital or skin tone capital, uh, which if that's reality in the real world, it's reality in the game world too. Um, one other example of this would be, so in real estate, if you're trying to sell a house in real estate and you have a black household that, you know, live in the house, you know, for years trying to sell the house, the real estate agent, you know, and the black family, like if they're both thinking about this logically, um, not saying it's the right thing for the world, but logically speaking, like how the world operates, what they do is a, a process called the black box. And what the black box is, is you get all the pictures like on the staircase, you know, um, like the dresser, dining room table, all the pictures of like the black family you have in the house, put them into a box, put it into the garage somewhere, hence the black box, and then go to Walmart, buy some Walmart pictures of like a white family, put those up on the wall instead you'll have uh, more success in fact selling the house, right? Because now it's like, oh, it's a house that was owned by a white family, not a black family. Like that helps you as a real estate agent get the best price for the family trying to sell. Right? So that's just reality when it comes to racial um, capital and also for the game world, skin tone capital. So what that means when it comes to the avatars I tend to make over time, this is like my darkest skin avatar I've ever had. Uh, no one's been as dark as a uh, gamer girl has, but uh, what that means is you want to ensure that you um, create an avatar with some of a lighter skin tone. Uh, her skin tone was, I think, a little bit uh, lighter at first. I made her darker after, like, I changed my hairstyle at the same time. And it's just you know, that kind of one-time major switch I made over a few things. But skin tone is important uh, when it comes to this. So we like the exact same setup, the exact same way I have my hair, the skirt I might wear you know, having my makeup, you know, similar way, but like a darker skin tone, I would get less help from males. I'd have less males trying to court me, less males giving me attention in the game um, if I, in fact, was darker than my avatar already currently is, which is darker than I've ever had in my entire life. Um, so, kind of going to an example of that. 
we did like a study in my lab um, recently. We're like still analyzing some data from it, but the study basically found several different lines of uh, you know, patterns of outcomes where, you know, showing yourself a certain way on Instagram stories, using like filters to make your skin appear to be lighter is something people tend to do, especially if they have a darker skin tone. Um, so this is an example from like a previous you know, video game study uh, where an interview we for the study by Lee 2014 mentioned that when she made a black looking avatar as herself, she was referred to as a freak by another gamer on the game. Um, there's like uh, 14 or there's like a pretty high number of millions of people who play Final Fantasy 14. Um, it's in, it increased a lot last year. But if you just go around the game worlds, just looking at different avatars and people, you will notice pretty quickly that it's kind of hard to ever find an avatar that's not a liar skin tone. Or like, it's just hard to find a black avatar, period. Um, there's like this one point I had to quiz up where if, um, if I said to a black avatar who I in fact found the game that you're so brave, you know, for being a black avatar, like um, at what point would that be a microaggression versus, you know, an actual compliment? Obviously, it's a microaggression because you're saying that something about the person inherently themselves is brave to show as though it's like, you know, bad or negative it's like be uh, a black avatar. But that's just how rare it is to find a black avatar. And the larger point I'm trying to get to with this uh, is this, is whenever you see black avatars, they're usually going to be in games like sports games. This is a poll I had up last year asking people basically, when do you think you're most likely to see avatar with a darker skin tone? Would you create one with a dark skin tone? It's going to be sports games, 100%. The other option, which you can't even see because it's 100%, the other option for this would be like um, uh, adventure games, basically, MMO RPG games. Um, no one answered in that direction. So. If you will create a black avatar, a black avatar for Madden football, NBA 2K, WNBA 2K now, um, for Grand Theft Auto, uh, Five Online, uh, Call of Duty, but you won't make a black avatar for adventure games. What you're basically kind of saying is that something about the essentiality that we assume with race, skin tone, um, the idea that if you're a black athlete, that's going to confer maybe some um differential performance when it comes to athleticism and stuff like that that you're basically making the assumption that that same degree of like speed and like you know how high you can jump that helps you dunk over someone is somehow no longer um desirable or useful when it comes to trying to outrun a dragon right so like you're fast enough to like get a 70 yard pass to score a touchdown we want that kind of speed there absolutely but we have to like outrun a dragon chasing us or like a mob of goblins, you know, or like um, uh, like an ogre or something like that. Like, no, we don't want the same speed in that, in that uh, context. Now, obviously the point I'm getting to is just that we're okay uh, with maybe like, you know, Hispanic, uh, Asian, black avatars being seen more often in that context of like sports, of the basketball, football, or the criminal based games, GTA 5 online. Call of Duty, right? So guns, you know, people dying, shooting, stuff like that. We're okay with the avatars who are Asian, Hispanic, and Black in those contexts. When it comes to a context of pulling the sword from the stone, the context of, you know, one ring to rule them all, going to Mordor, um, when it comes to the context of, you know, saving a princess from the dragon in the tower, or Bowser, I guess you could say, uh, Princess Peach, we're now okay with, like, the hero of that narrative, which will be longer than, say, like, a one-hour you know, play on Madden football, that the hero of that narrative we're going to be using for maybe tens of hours, you know, uh, for any given game, that avatar not reflecting what we're maybe used to expecting, which would be a white male character. Um, at least until recently, there's been like more females in the last five to six years, but historically it's been white male avatars. Um, so that's the reason for the dichotomy with this, is that you'll see people maybe borrowing uh, the Black, the Hispanic, the Asian identity um, you know, as a minority for an hour playing NBA 2K or playing Madden football or playing GTA 5 online or playing Call of Duty, they're kind of like borrowing uh, being that person for a period of time. But you can easily just take it off and go back, you know, to everything else. There's, there's nothing that the person is learning about what it means to be that individual, to be in that body when they're playing Madden or when they're playing GTA 5 online. They're not learning anything about what that person really goes through in a narrative way. Whereas when you play as Aloy in Horizon Zero Dawn, which is why I got PS4 in the first place myself, I don't remember why I played that one game, but um, when you play as Aloy, 
you actually really get to see her grow up. The start of the game is when she's like four or five years old. She's just like a little kid running around. So you start the game off as a little girl. You grow up as her. You see her develop and mature, right? There, there's a sense of this long-term narrative building with this person. You become more and more empathetically tied to, care about. Uh, you have a moral stake, basically, in the choices you make in the game when it comes to her, right? Like you're morally complicit in the outcomes of the game about this person that you are increasingly caring about. You're not going to see as often the same kind of like game where it's like, oh, it's a little black girl. It's a little Hispanic girl. It's a little Asian girl growing up. You're going to like see her when she's an adult. You're going to play the game through through her eyes for 50 hours. You're not going to see that kind of game as often as you'll see it um, via like the white male's eyes, especially, but even like, you know, a white female's eyes. Um, and thankfully, we at least have more games of female options now and female leads in general. Uh, but that that's the difference is that you'll see more often the, um, you know, minorities, the Hispanic, the Asian and black minorities in games where it's about sports or, you know, the criminal stuff or shooter, shooter around games, you won't see it like in long term narrative games at all. Any thoughts or reactions or uh, comments on that? So Dr. Willis, you have quite a few comments in the chat and many are echoing exactly what you share. You know, the information you share today is amazing, is enlightened. And um, so one comment said, this is cool. Um, the whole gaming system, but others said, why are games so racist? You know, and then others are looking at it from the standpoint, you're just like your topic, you're making us aware that this is reality, even though it's in the game where we live it every day. And so um, this is how Blacks and Hispanics and Asians are being portrayed in movies. One of the um, chat uh, attendees um, um, shared it as well. So you have a lot of comments. Um, please share why games are so racist. Well, my take on that would be um, something referred to as statistical discrimination, which basically is going back to the iPod example and the black box, that the real estate agents and the family trying to sell a house, you know, the black family, in fact, trying to sell a house, they know that the black pictures are going to lead to a lower price and a lower chance to sell. The person trying to sell an iPod online, Google Shop, whatever, knows they're going to have a better chance selling it if it's a white man holding it. Or even, let's just say, have um, a hand with a glove on, right? So, like, a glove on is, like, maybe a perfect default condition, right? So, you can, like, tell the race of the person with the glove on. But, you know, the idea is that if we know that the reality is you have a better chance to sell the iPod, a uh, better chance to uh, sell the house when it's seen as owned by a white family, when it's held by a white man, then... The utilitarian arguments or idea is going to be, why not maximize their outcomes and just go in that direction? Um, now, despite how well that might work financially in a way of like trying to compensate for race or a way of trying to just kind of play to consumers, you know, base instincts about these kind of things, um, it doesn't really help, you know, to push us forward any way towards maybe every single hand pulling the iPod leading to the same price or a house with pictures of black families leading to the same real estate, you know, uh, outcome or success. But it is reality that we're currently living. Um, so Obama might say, you have to deal with the world as you find it. Uh, but it does make it hard to get out of that mold if we're just maybe trying to um, adjust to it to get to the best outcome uh, in terms of what we can uh, get in return. So it's, I don't look at it so much as like games being intentionally racist. You, I mean, you have like more games now where they will have more minorities there are sidekicks and things like that. Um, but usually the characters they're portraying are maybe somewhat narrow in how their, their lines, the scripts of those characters are, are made, where the things that they say and do are maybe just, it, it gives diversity, but the diversity is not inclusive where we're looking at inclusion as being the, the broadness of how you see them placed in that narrative context, right? So if the broadness you see that person place is, um, oh, they're a gangbanger, um, oh, they're they're trying to like rob someone, or they're making like you know slang terms and like you know, they're like a funny person, they're the comic relief in the game. Uh, well, if that's like the context they're being used in, that's not an inclusive contextualization. You want to broaden the context, broaden the narrative, so anyone, you know. Um, Black, Hispanic, Asian can be the person who pulls the sword from the stone, not just, you know, King Arthur. Anyone can take the ring, 
not just Froto baggins. That's the idea. And we are not really seeing those things happen yet. Dr. Willis, um, Dr. Kihana has a question, um, quite lengthy. Um, he has several questions. Dr. Kihana, would you like to uh, ask your questions aloud? He may be. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I got it. Um, so my question has to do with something you mentioned about a while back about oh, people David, overperforming. I'm so happy to see you. He's got to say, I'm happy to see you as well. <laughs> Yeah, yes, likewise. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, so something that you mentioned that had to do with people overperforming uh, avatars of the other gender, like women kind of overplaying, you know, a kind of hyper masculine role or when men play as female avatars, con them constantly going like, hey, did you know I'm bi? Um, so why do you think that happens? Is it like a social thing? Is it subconscious bias? Is it like, do we assume, do, do we have a picture of what that other gender, quote unquote, should be like, um, like, like what's at the root of that, do you think? I think it goes back to the broadness versus narrowness, the narratives and the roles uh, that we're maybe comfortable with or used to seeing males and females portray. Um, it's also why if you play as a female avatar in a single player game, it's usually a better version of the game than if you play as like the male option for games like that. Because, I mean, if you like imagining a TV show or movie, if there is a sad scene where someone is going to maybe cry or shed tears, like make sure they're crying on, usually it's like the lead actress who is going to cry in that scene, whereas the male is going to be like the one to like let her cry on, on his arm or shoulder or something, right? So females, you know, usually have more practice when they're at UCLA, art school, or USC uh, doing these kind of things than males usually get. And so as a result, if you play a game as a female, you're going to have like a, a much uh, more in-depth experience in the story, more interpersonal relating, much more emotionally driven narrative uh, than say a male in the, in the same role. Because uh, we're not used to like seeing males performing in the same way and males themselves maybe don't practice it enough. And so whenever a female is playing as a male avatar, she's probably thinking to herself, it's about like the narrowness uh, around like which we kind of box masculinity. You know, she, on Instagram it's like called the, male, the man box basically, right? So if uh, males are kind of placed in a box where any degree of femininity um, is seen as being less masculine, seen as being less of a real man, uh, in that real men kind of reject, express some emotions that real men like, you know, don't um, uh, make themselves feel vulnerable and stuff like that. Then females trying to play as males might overperform that aspect. Um, that's just kind of what we primarily see and understand males as being. Uh, now, when, when uh, males play as females, given the wider range that we usually see of how females are portrayed in TV shows, movies, so on and so forth, um, it's really kind of hard for males to overperform. Um, usually whenever males overperform gender, it tends to be in terms of like body proportionality, especially things like breast size. Uh, so that's, that, that's kind of a key reason why. It goes like back to gender roles and, and the range we give to each sex. All right, good, thanks. Dr. Willis, we acknowledge it is 4.30, but there is one last question. Um, well, I'm, I'm here for 10 more minutes even. I mean, bring oh, okay, okay <laughs> great. Minutes. Um, one of our participants said, I wonder why males flirt with female avatars when they don't know how or who the person is behind the playing. Um, it's because if we're doing our job well, how we perform ourselves and our sense of, you know, sexuality, so we're performing by sexuality, like this research goes into, uh, your punctuation usage and, and things like that. If we're doing that job well enough to where you can't tell that we're actually a male, then you're gonna be somewhat inclined to try and flirt with us. <laughs> um, in which case we're usually going to respond um, by, you know, flirting back or like, you know, maybe saying like something nice or approving, taking a compliment, that kind of stuff. And basically we might kind of shadow you, like kind of walk behind you, go with you doing certain things, you know, certain quests. Um, so like one thing I didn't actually mention in, in the talk, you know, earlier is the difference in punctuation use, which whenever someone flirts with you, what you say, your punctuation usage is a good way to reinforce the idea that you're a woman. Um, let me just like see, this is like stuff from my own lab I'm about to show right now, our research we did with this, but basically um, whenever I interact with people in text messaging or in emails as myself, like Jared, you know, uh, Gmail or UCSD in emails, I have used fewer exclamation points in emails as me Going back to my first came to California from Texas in May 2015, I've used three exclamation points and emails as myself 
that I've used as Gamer Girl in Guild Checks since this January 1st, right? Because when I use, uh, when I talk as her, I'm trying to perform as a female. I mean, in, in this research over several decades has found consistently, females use more exclamation points and more excited, you know, kind of language than males usually do. Um, so whenever like a guy works with me, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna buy right into it and just like kind of like talk back with him a way I would maybe imagine uh, if I was, you know, a woman that I would interact with someone. And I just like gotten so good at doing that over time that now it's just second nature to me. It's like, I, I turn on the PS4, the Xbox, and I basically kind of like switch off like one aspect of myself into another one uh, to like try and make sure I get the best experience out of the game in terms of can I get somebody to help me out with this boss, you know, uh, uh, tonight or something. So that's, that's the idea. Uh, when you do it long enough, you start getting pretty good at the role of performance. And that includes uh, using things like emotes. Uh, and this is a state that was actually on Final Fantasy XIV, like actually on that game I'm talking about right now. So females use emotes more in the game than males do. Females uh, will use like LOL, MAOA, that kind of stuff more in the game than males do. Um, which again goes back to this decades of research on how females use punctuation, you know, the punctuation of sex, right? So um, that's how you kind of like make sure when someone flirts with you that you maximize the flirtation in terms of getting his attention. Thank you. I Absolutely. don't see any additional questions at this particular point. Are there any other questions for Dr. Willis? I wanted to quickly mention this example as well. Um, so the image in the far left of this, if you like to ignore the other person, the image in the far, far left of this, I was at this point in time just sitting outside by myself like doing nothing, just kind of like watching the NPCs do stuff, you know, just non-playable characters. And a male gamer, this person right here uh, with the beard and everything, the gamer comes by me, sees me sitting outside, and he decides to trade with me. He decides to trade um, to give me like a free invitation to a wedding because he wants to like increase, you know, the women who are going to be there, that kind of stuff. He saw me sitting outside, thought it was hot. So I give me like his free invite to a wedding, a platinum level wedding. I'm just thinking, okay, a platinum level wedding costs like $20 in real like USD money. And I'm just like getting the chance to go to this thing, you know, just for free. Now, if you're like, you know, buy it to it, the idea is it's going to be free for anyone regardless. But uh, the idea is that you probably reserve, you know, people getting tickets and invitations only for like those you actually know. I'm just a stranger outside looking hot, you know, like, in the game, um, like doing hot girl stuff. And he sees me and he gives me like this free invite for the wedding. And it's just... It's incredible sometimes. I mean, when I was playing Elder Scrolls, um, I asked uh, like our guild leader if I can like just borrow forty thousand dollars out of like the guild chest to go buy a skirt. Gave it to me. Just it's it's amazing how easy it is. Um, but so oh yeah, definitely. You can follow me on Twitter, I think your hands are, yeah, so put it into the chat. And also Instagram is in the chat. So it's it is like really amazing the experience you have with this. I mean, there's so much more I can go into with it. I know we're out of time, but if there are additional questions, feel free to ask before we uh, close out here in a few minutes. I also want to mention one more thing um, uh, officially, though. The reason I call this Woman Like Me is because it's a play off of a book that was written decades ago uh, by an author named, uh, it's what it's called, Black Like Me. So what he did in real life, he uh, took medicine to change his skin tone. He's a white, you know, journalist, you know, uh, he decided to make himself, you know, look more like a, like a black person, take, take medicine to do so, um, which is really harmful for his health and anyway, what he went through doing it, but he succeeded in having his skin tone change. Um, it was like for a short period of time, his skin returned to uh, like, you know, as he was more like a white male. Um, but in the period of time in which he was like trans, you know, racial, basically, racial like is all, I guess. Um, and when he was transracial, he basically was a researcher doing ethnography, just like I'm doing myself. And so the reason I call women like me is because I'm kind of doing off of his black like me. He got to see and write about as a journalist things that he went through when he was a black male in the South, the way he was treated when he was a black male compared to the way he treated his rest of his whole life when he was a white male. Uh, he became a white male again, obviously, when the drugs, medication were off, but um, just like I've become an XY male again once I let off the game, I'm like back to me myself. Um, but I do experience some things in the game world uh, when I'm a woman that I've never thought about uh, in real life. I mean, there was even like a, a, a time in one of the games I played where I would just make sure it's like wear rings on each finger to make sure it seems like I'm spoken for, like I'm not single. So like, here's my rings, like I'm not single. Uh, like guys back off me a little bit, like stop being so aggressive and stuff. So 
Um, it's just, yeah, it's, it's like one of those things uh, where unless you can be in someone's shoes and have a sense of what they experience, you know, playing the role of female avatar, online game or single player game uh, with a great narrative, um, or playing as a Black or Asian Hispanic avatar in a single player game, hopefully one day where it's not something like GTA V, but frankly, um, you can like get a sense of what someone else might really go through. Um, and hopefully games will start to go more that direction where it's not just about being diverse in terms of NPCs or diverse in terms of your teammates, but it's also about inclusion of narrative where you might have a Black, Hispanic, or Asian character that has a narrative that's just as inclusively uh, multidimensional in where it might go in the storyline as you might have had for any white character forever. Uh, that's what we need to start seeing.